and last week something kind of hit home with me and it's kind of the basis for this sermon today but it was somebody said why doesn't the Holy Spirit move through our church or why are we not seeing it and God really laid on my heart that this is something we, we need to talk about that I need to preach about and I'm going to apologize now if I step on any toes, okay? But receiving of the Holy Spirit is something that we... I'm going to move my mic down a little bit. Receiving the Holy Spirit is something that we get when we, when we ask. We have to be humble to God. It's an expectation. But there are certain things that can flow through the church that can, that can keep the Holy Spirit from being welcome. Uh, they can range from prejudices within the church and other factors, and I'm going to get into those. At least some of the ones that I think are very key. Um, so I'm just going to, kind of, going to kind of dig right into it because we're going to be doing communion, so I don't want to run long in time here. To me, I think one of the biggest important things in order for us to fill a movement of the Holy Spirit in churches, first and foremost, is we all have to be prayer, prayerfully gathered here. There, there, there's an old, old gospel preacher by the name of John Rice. Maybe a relative, I don't know. But he said that God requires, and men often need to plead with God for any want, for supply, for deliverance, for wisdom, or for power. I firmly believe that when you pray, you should have any distractions away from you. At home, when, when, when I have my time with God, I go down to my man cave. I go down to the basement where I can be by myself and I'll just sit in the chair and it's just me and God. That's where I have my opportunity to cry my heart out to him and, and, and bring things up that I need to be praying about. I have a an application I use for a lot of my studies, and but I have a, on there, it's, it's a, a card that pops up and it gives me a list of things that I put down there that I want to be praying for, for people that I know that are going through illnesses or sicknesses or people that are going through financial problems. But you, you have to give 100% of your time when you're in prayer. I'm going to give you some examples. In Genesis thirty-two twenty-six, Jacob wrestled all night with an angel. Okay, it says that then the man said, "Let me go, for it is daybreak." But Jacob replied, "I will not let you go unless you bless me." Jacob was wrestling with an angel. He was fervent. He wanted to be blessed. He wanted to receive something from God, and he wasn't going to stop. He was going to fight tooth and nail until what he got what he wanted. In 1 Samuel 15, 11, Samuel cried out to the Lord all night. You know, sometimes our prayers should not just last seconds. Sometimes our prayers should not just last minutes. Sometimes our prayers need to last hours. Sometimes you have to pray until you hear what you want from God. You know, Samuel was upset because Saul was made king and because he was turned away from me and I carried out his instructions, Samuel was angry and he cried out all night asking for forgiveness. Thought he had made a bad decision.
Another one is Esther and her maidens fasted, prayed three days and nights for deliverance. Prayer's been going on a long time. You know, there's been times I prayed just for a few minutes and I felt at, at peace. You know, I felt like God was listening. There's been times I've gone and I've prayed for for minutes and minutes and minutes and minutes and hours and felt like God wasn't listening. But I continued to press on. I, I continued to pray. But we have to be persistent in our prayers. We have to not give up in our prayers. There's, there's a parable... It's not really a parable, but it, about a, uh, a woman from Canaan whose daughter was uh, demon-possessed. And uh, she ran and she approached Jesus and says, you know, Lord, son of David, she said, have mercy on me. My daughter's demon-possessed and suffering terribly. And you know what happened? Jesus ignored her, tuned her out completely. You ever prayed and it felt like God just wasn't listening? God had just completely tuned you out? And then you just kind of gave up? I know that's happened with me before. But the, the, the woman, she kept pushing. And finally the disciples said, Lord, can't you do something? You know, you know she's getting on our nerves. You know, she's, she's just not giving up. So after she approached Jesus again, Jesus told her, she goes, well, he goes, I was sent here only to, only for the lost sheep of Israel. But she persisted. She said, Lord, help me. I need you. I need you to do this for me. You know, my, my, my daughter is just, is she, she's suffering terribly. She's got this, this, this possession. I need you to do something for her. And Jesus said, uh, that's not right to take the children's bread and, and toss it to the dogs. But she, the lady answered that, I agree. But she also said, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their masters. And at that time, Jesus, because of her persistence and her keeping on, said, by your faith, it is done. And this demon was cast out of, the, out of her daughter's uh, body. You have to be persistent. We as a church, if we want to see the Spirit of God move to this place, we have to be persistent in our prayers. We have to be. And here in a minute, I'm going to talk to you about why many times that we're not persistent in our prayers. There was times that even Jesus himself, he pr prayed all night. In Luke 6, 12, it just simply says, one of, these one of those days Jesus went out to the mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. Even Jesus himself was persistent in prayer. He was persistent in crying out to God. If you want the Holy Spirit to move, cry out to God. A lot of times I think people pray and I'm not going to say you give up too easily but sometimes I think people pray and Jeff I'm going to use you for an example you, you mentioned here I don't know if it was last week or a couple weeks ago but about how you felt Jesus' hand on your shoulder, God's hand on your shoulder, okay? And that's great. 
But sometimes you have to go for more than that. Sometimes you have to pray. You have to seek the face of God. You have to look for more than that touch. When you get to the point where you start seeking the face of God and you start get to that point, that's when you're going to see the greatest of blessings come upon you. That's when we're going to see the greatest blessings that come, come upon the church. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that filling God's hand on your shoulder is, is not enough because it is. Because sometimes you're just in a situation where you just need to feel all that touch at that moment. Sometimes you just need to feel that, that, that touch of grace. Maybe that you're doing something right or you're making a right decision. But also push yourself to see the face of God. I'm going to kind of talk in military terminology here for a second. But in the military, in combat situations, there, there's two components. We have what we call rear echelon. And when I say rear echelon, are those people back in support, maybe your medics, uh, maybe your flight crews, uh, the people that, that are doing things in the back, behind the scenes, okay? But then you have what you call your forward echelon. These are the guys that are on the battle line. They're on the front line. They're doing the fighting, okay? Now, if you put it in this perspective, who do you think is going to get the better benefit? Is it going to be the person sitting in the rear echelon? Or is it going to be the person up in the, on the front lines doing all the fighting? We as the Christians, when we, we're seeking God and we're praying and we want to see something done, we have to be on the front lines. Not in the back. Put yourself out front. Put yourself out there completely and totally. Does that make sense? That's when you're going to see your, you know, it's, even though you have the people back supporting the units on the front, okay? But it's that, those people on the front that are, that are getting the job done. They're the ones that are making the difference. So if you want to see a difference, we as Christians, let's put ourselves out on the front lines in prayer and in everything that we do. Next up I want to talk about is uh, we have to be gathered together with expectations. You have to think about what are you expecting when you come to a church service. Are you coming to church? Are you walking through the doors in the morning and you're already humbling yourself to God and you're expecting to see great things in church? Or are you coming to church and think about, well, after the service, where are we going to go for lunch? I know I've done that before. My, my mind was not in the right place. I wasn't thinking about it correctly. I'm just going to simply say that if, if you're a Christian and you're a believer in Christ and you're for, here for any other reason than to worship God, you're making a terrible, terrible mistake. You reap what you sow. If you're coming through the doors and you're here to glorify God and give praise to God, you're going to get it back in return. You know, I remember back in the day when I was a kid, you know, you know, and everybody was trying to get himself a Christian girlfriend, you know. And all the young, young Christian guys, we and we're girls vice versa looking for our Christian boyfriend was only worried about who's available who's not taken okay their mind wasn't set on God I've also been through instances where coming to service where there was upheaval, upheaval in the church to the point where in the middle of a service Deacons were arguing with the pastor. Pastor was arguing with the deacons. The pastor was calling people out in the, out in the service for, for not doing their part in, in church. You think that's going to glorify God? You think that's going to allow the Holy Spirit to move into church? Ain't no way. They've done taking 
things that had to, nothing to do with glorifying Christ and made it a priority. In Acts 1.8, it specifically tells us what we're commanded to expect in church. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. We are expected to see the Holy Spirit in church. But we have to do our part. We can't sit in the back. We can't worry about what we're going to do for lunch. We can't worry about the gossip going on in church. Okay? But we have to come in and be ready to raise our hands and praise God and give him glory and ask for the Holy Spirit to move. In Acts 1, 12 through 13, it talks about how the, the apostles responded to this. And it says that the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to a room where they were staying. There present was Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas son of James. Do you know why they went there? Because this was going to be the place where they were going to sit there and they were going to give it all to God. They were going to lift their hands. And you know what? The Holy Spirit didn't come on them automatically. It didn't come on them instantaneously. It started out because they gathered together for worship. They gathered together to give praise. And we need to be doing the same thing. We have to put everything to the side. That has to be our, our mindset. That has to be our thought process if we want to start seeing the Holy Spirit to move. Worship is all about being intimate with God. It's not about the worship music, though I do enjoy the worship music. It sets the tone for me. It's not about having a good sermon. But those are all things that you need to use to your benefit to bring the Holy Spirit to move, to bring God to move in the house of God. In the house of God. I kind of mentioned before, which is real important, is we have to be gathered in unity. We have to be gathered in like mind, like thought. If you want to see the Holy Spirit to move, we cannot in any way, shape, or form, I believe, show up for church and having our own reasons for being here and then expect God to move. God built this church. And it's up to us to be united in everything that we do in order for God to, to work through us, for the Holy Spirit to work through us. When I talk about unity, if you think about it on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2, 5, in Acts 2 4, it says that they were all praying and worshiping in one accord. One person wasn't worried about what the other person was doing. This person wasn't worried about what this was doing. They weren't thinking about what they're going to go do for lunch. They were all in unity. They were all in praise for one common goal, and that was lifting up the name of Jesus Christ. And we all know what happened to that. After that is the Holy Spirit set, set upon them like, like tongues of fire. If we 
you want to see that here? We have to be in unity. Something that, that in preparing this sermon that the Holy Spirit laid on my heart And this might be a touchy one. Are the, are the things that can disunify us. And this is where I'm kind of concerned I might step on some toes. And first and foremost, it's negative attitudes. Because of personal preferences or things that are going on. You know, the, the church here has gone through a... I'm going to say we've gone through a lot in the past couple months. And my concern is, is because of things that have happened, things that people have said to other people, that it's created negative attitudes. I remember a... a, a series I went through that, that Aaron required me to do uh, when he asked me to become associate pastor and to talk, talk about being oppressed. And it was something I ever actually never ever thought about before. Okay? In any way, shape, or form. And scripture says, you know, that I can't guarantee that you won't be oppressed. I can't guarantee that your feelings are not going to get hurt. I can't guarantee that something's not going to happen to you. But God can guarantee that if something does happen to you, that he can take care of it. Amen? I never, never, ever realized before, until after I went through that series on oppression, of things that I was harboring. I was hard to remind that it's not even alive anymore. It, it was like running into a brick wall. I'm like, wow. I can't believe I was harving, harving this. And how do you get out of a place of oppression? Is you need to talk to the individual or individuals or persons or where, whoever it might be, if you're able to talk to them. I guess getting, getting it off your chest would be a good way to put it. A spirit of oppression will keep the Holy Spirit from working in this church. So I want you to keep, you know, if that has anything to do with you, if anybody out here on Facebook is watching the sermon today and they're not here today and that has anything to do with you, I, I suggest that you seek. Don't look for the, the touch of God's hand on your shoulder, but I suggest you seek the face of God and fix it. A very simple disunifying spirit like that will keep this church from being at its best. I know this church in the past has had a lot of baggage. Okay? But hopefully we're beyond that. One of the, thing, one of the things that attracted me to this church is, is we do life together. And if somebody's hurt your feelings and you start holding all that in, we're not doing, you're not doing life together with the rest of the church. You're on your own. You've created your own island. We have to be unified in, in, in method, how we do things. We have to be unified in our purpose. What's our purpose? Kingdom work. 
experience uh, spreading the gospel of Jesus to the people of Frenchtown, St. Charles, Florissant, wherever we're at. That's our purpose. We have to be unified in our faith. Our faith in Jesus Christ. What he can do for us. But most importantly, you want to see the Holy Spirit move in this place, you have to believe that God, that God can and he will show up. If you're not feeling that, he's not going to be here. You know. It says that Jesus is knocking at the door of my heart or your heart. And if you open it, I'll come in and I'll sup with you and you with me. But if you don't open the door, he's not going to force himself on you. Final topic I want to talk about is we have to be worshipfully gathered. Wor worshipfully? Is that a word? Worshipfully like gathered. In Luke 18, 17, it says, Verily I say to you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. We just went through Halloween. Anybody get any trick-or-treaters? Come to your house. I didn't get any. I guess I scared them out. I guess they knew new cousin that was there or something. I don't know. But a little child, you know what? You got this big old thing of candy. And they come to the door and you go, trick or treat. You got this big old thing of candy. Boy, they're ready to dig in, man. They're, they're in a childish way. They're ready to grab that candy. They're ready to receive it. They're ready to take it on. That's how we have to do with the Holy Spirit. We have to approach it with the mind of a child. We have to say, God, here I am. Fill me, use me, give me more. Until then, I don't think we're gonna, you're going to see it. It's not just going to come upon you just because you have to ask. If we're going to worship, worship God in, as one, we have to set ourselves aside. We have to set ourselves away, aside from distractions. Now, I'm not going to say all distractions, and I'm going to tell you why. If you've got something that's going on in your life, and you're going to bring it to church with you, you need to bring it to church with you, with you and be prepared to turn it over to God. And let God take it off your shoulders. But if you bring it for, here for any other reason, then don't. You know, I, when I was a manager, I used to tell my employees, I understand the fact that you've got personal problems in, your, in life. And some of you, you might have heard this before, but when you come to work, check it at the door. So I wholeheartedly tell you, if you've got something going on and you want to raise it, God, bring it with you. But if you're going to bring it into the church to weigh, it, weigh you down, to weigh the church down, leave it at the door. We have to set aside our preferences, our agendas. You know, kind of talked about before, you know, you know, if you're showing up for church with your own personal agenda and it's not going to glorify God, don't bring it. Basically what I'm saying, if it's going to interfere in any way, shape, or form, 
with you making a connection with God that's going to hinder the Holy Spirit working through the church, don't bring it with you. That's pretty much the end of my notes. I've already mentioned it several times before. I'm not one who, who God visits in visions or dreams. When I was talking to Aaron last night, I told, I told him that God works to me because he, he, he puts a voice in my heart. He talks to me in my heart. And trust me, I, when I tell you that when chains here in the church are going to be broken and there's going to be a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that's not coming from my head. I'm not crazy. Okay? Some people might think I am, but I'm not. But I'm not crazy. But God is ready to unleash His Spirit in this church. God is ready to unleash his spirit in Frenchtown, in St. Charles, in Florissant, in St. Uh, St. Peter's, Weldon Springs, through all of St. Louis County, St. Louis. But before that can happen, we have to humble ourselves before God. We gotta say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We want you here. We want you to move. I want to feel you. That has to be your mindset. God wants to give us our heart's desires. You know, and it may be something just as simple as, as you need to have an individual one-on-one -on -one time with you and God. And I'm not saying sit down and in your favorite recliner and pray for two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, but maybe persist until you get what you want. I remember a woman from, from, from a church I went to a long, long time ago when I was still a kid. And it was an Assemblies of God church. And you know what? It took her more than months to receive the gift of tongues. It took her more than years to get the gift of tongues. But you know what? She was persistent. This was back in the day when you had Sunday service, you had Sunday night service, you had Thursday night service, you had Bible study on Wednesday. Felt like I was living in church. Kind of like I feel now. Feel like I'm living here sometimes. But you know what? She was persistent. Every time there was an altar call, she was down at the, at the altar. She was on her knees, and she was praying, and she was crying, and she was raising her hands, and she was just lifting God up, saying, Lord, when? Touch me, fill me. But that night wasn't it. And trust me, I tell you, this went on for, for years. Uh, it could have been because something was going on in her life. I don't know. But it was that, just that one Sunday night when she went up there for an altar call and she, again, she got down on her knees and she was crying out to God, Lord, fill me. And it was that night that God sp spoke to her she was having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with God. Just the two of them. If you haven't been there, or if you have been there, maybe you just need, need a, a new refreshing. Sit down. Have that conversation with God. Seek out his face. Say, Holy Spirit, I need you. Fill me up. Work through me today. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, 
But when you have things right within you, that's when he'll come. Amen. I love you all. Hope I didn't hurt anybody's feelings today. But God said, call it how it is. So, this time we're going to go ahead and move in, into communion, if that's okay. This is something that we're going to start doing uh, first Sunday of every month.